Hello? Great. Yep. Excellent. Yep. So welcome, everyone, to this panel. Uh, two houses, both alike in dignity, Gateway API and MCS API. I'm Stephen Kitt. I work for Red Hat on the Submariner project. I'm Rob Scott. I work for Google on Kubernetes networking, and I'm a Gateway API maintainer. And I'm Mike Morris, and I work for HashiCore on console. And I am one of the co-leads of the Gamma uh, initiative. <laughs> And you may notice that, unfortunately, Laura could not be here in person, but she was able to pre-record what I think is a very creative intro. <laughs> Hi, all. This is Laura coming at you from the past, as I was not able to travel to KubeCon EU this year. Instead, I have the privilege of sending my digital form to you to give a quick intro to our panel topics for two houses, both alike in Dignity, Gateway API, and MCS API. So what we want to talk about today is these three general projects, MCS API, Gateway API, and Service Meshes, and where they overlap and how they are coming together. We've been thinking a lot about these uh, little overlapping joints in here in the Venn diagram. So all of these projects in the center here, all of them bundle some backends together. So some higher level of abstraction like a service to bundle some endpoints together. MCS and service meshes are both very concerned with providing ways to discover a service, especially across cluster boundaries. The gateway API and service meshes both do traffic shaping with different levels of expressibility and sophistication. And meanwhile, all the service meshes usually have a whole other suite of things that they are able to independently do, like securing traffic, for example. So since all of these projects are still a little bit in flux, it's informative to know at least a little bit about their history. Um, but the most important part is that these efforts have been evolving all along the same time in the face of shared problems that were really clarified in 2019, that users needed more sophisticated traffic solutions than were available in Kubernetes at the time, but that the solution space, which was pioneered by all these different projects collectively known as service meshes was too fragmented. So a few of those uh, projects connected on their own attempt to converge uh, called the service mesh interface or SMI spec. And at the same time, SIG multi-cluster and SIG network respectively approached individual pieces of the problem in the form of the MCS and gateway APIs. So the MCS and Gateway APIs went through a very exploratory period in 2020, but have standardized a lot, especially in 2021, both in terms of the API maturity level and the breadth of implementations that were using the API. And then in 2022, the successor kind of to the SMI spec, the Gamma initiative, uh, picked up the mantle to try and bridge the gap between the converging service meshes and these maturing Kubernetes native API standards. So we were really attached to the title of our talk. So we're going to quickly demonstrate how these APIs all come together with a little bit of Shakespeare. Um, I don't know how much of you watched the 1993 version of Romeo and Juliet, uh, but we have Leonardo DiCaprio cast as Romeo Montague over here on the left, and Claire Danes as Juliet Capulet over here on the right. And if you're familiar with the story, you know that Romeo and Juliet fell in love despite being in desperately feuding families that didn't want them to be together. Or in this case today, we're going to pretend that they're in desperate feuding clusters instead. So let's say Juliet says her classic line, except in a Kubernetes kind of way. So instead of Romeo, Romeo, where for art thou, Romeo, it's Romeo.Montague.SVC.Cluster.Local, where for art thou, Romeo.Montague.SVC.Cluster.Local, right? So in the story, Romeo meets her at a party at the Capulet house. Um, he later visits at her window. So we need to get Romeo a way to respond to this request at her window, at her cluster, instead of being isolated in his cluster. So we can represent this with the MCS API in API form if we have Romeo over here as a deployment uh, local to the Montague cluster with a service in front of it local to the Montague cluster. We can create a service export from the MCS API to export it to the Capulet cluster and a service import representing that Romeo service will now appear in the Capulet cluster so that the Juliet deployment there can interact with it. Part of this is that uh, services from other clusters exported this way can be queried by a familiar DNS, so we can change Ro Juliet's line. Now she can ask, where for art though, romeo.montague.svc.cluster set.local, and Romeo will be able to respond. <laughs> 
But in the story, apparently it's not enough just to meet up on occasional evenings at a windowsill. Um, instead, in the story, Romeo and Juliet get a third party, Friar Lawrence, to marry them ASAP. And to marry them, Friar Lawrence will have to address each of them individually to say that ceremonial question, like, do you, Romeo, take this woman, Juliet, right? So let's make him an API resource as well. Um, we introduce a gateway API here because we can imagine Friar Lawrence as a client using an HTTP route from the gateway API that splits traffic based on URI paths. So slash Romeo is backed by the service import matching the Romeo service over here, and slash Juliet is backed by the service import matching the Juliet service over here. So when he instead asks, do you slash Romeo take this pod slash Juliet as your lawfully wedded wife, each service can respond even though they're in totally different clusters. I do have to give up the analogy for the sake of slide space now, but I want to introduce one last current event concept to give an example about gamma. So service meshes that conform to the gamma specification now have a way to interact with multi-cluster services from the MCS API and the traffic routing rules on the gateway API by respecting routes that have a service import as their parent ref. So by binding this service import in the parent ref, this indicates that the service mesh should intercept traffic destined for this service import and apply these gateway API expressible rules. So here we have a rule to match this path and add this um, header. So if you're following along with the um, API spec here, if only the Romeo service had been configured to add potion antidote header when attempting to slash wake up the Juliet service import upstream, perhaps the tragedy of this age old story could have been averted. So here we are four years along and a convoluted analogy afterwards. Um, but we're really excited now that the Gamma Initiative is helping tie all of this together in this overlap area, bringing all of these projects together and crystallizing it into a unified ecosystem that addresses users' needs and is all together um, a way that you can use all these projects. So now I will hand it off to the real live in-person folks to take your questions and elaborate a bit more on these themes uh, that I just talked about a little bit uh, from our abstract. So Rob, Stephen, Mike, take it away. <laughs> yes, I, I love that intro. She did an amazing job. Uh, uh, we're going to spend the next few minutes going through these questions, and then we'll have lots of time at the end uh, for, to take any questions from the audience. So if you have any, uh, we'll definitely have time for them. Uh, but we'll start uh, by going through these. Yeah, so I guess to start, uh, Rob and Steven, like, how do these APIs work together? Well, uh, <laughs> we've been spending a lot of time uh, talking about just that, as you can imagine now. Uh, th these APIs have a history of a few years at this point. Uh, I've been working on Gateway API for three and a half years since KubeCon San Diego. Uh, as Laura mentioned, MCS API also has a similar timeline. Uh, and some of the maintainers have been working on both. Uh, for example, uh, Jeremy, one of the maintainers in SIG Multicluster, uh, contributed, I think, TCP route to Gateway API. Uh, and I've been you know, helping review some of the MCS API uh, work. So, so there has been some crossover, but as strange as, as it sounds, multi-cluster services are not a SIG network thing. They're a SIG multi-cluster thing. So this is kind of a cross-SIG effort. Uh, so it has taken some proactive efforts to make sure that we're working together across SIGs to make these make sense. Uh, more recently, you know, we've had these discussions, we've had these high-level ideas, but those ideas were largely stuck in maintainers' heads <laughs> and not written down anywhere. Uh, so we've tried to take that step. Uh, in Gateway API, we have a concept called Gateway Enhancement Proposal, uh, and that's like a KEP, a Kubernetes Enhancement Proposal, uh, but we've d defined in great detail every little uh, nuance of how Gateway API and MCS API work. I forget the exact GEP number, but it's easy to find on Gateway API's website. And of course, we made sure we worked closely with SIG Multicluster, uh, Gamma, and Gateway API to make sure we're all collaborating and all have the same ideas for how these APIs interact. Uh, but maybe, Stephen, you can provide a bit more context. Yeah. So one of the things I find interesting is, as Laura said, um, all these initiatives have been going on for approximately the same number of years. But there's been very different dynamics. Um, so, you know, as Rob just explained, the Gateway API is such a big uh, 
initiative in practice that they have their own enhancement proposal uh, system, whereas um, SIG multi-cluster is much smaller, um, so we just use KEPS. Um, another difference, too, is that the Gateway API came out of a lot of frustration with earlier APIs, uh, you know, it's rising from the ashes of Ingress v1. And so there's, uh, there was a lot of uh, knowledge already before the Gateway API started, also a lot of actual real-world users uh, who knew what they wanted. Um, and so that was perhaps, well, it's easier because you get lots of people involved. That can also create <laughs> uh, more complexity, I guess. But it also means that uh, there's a better idea of what's going to be a good API, whereas in the multi-cluster space, uh, especially in 2019, the SIG was really inventing things. It probably still is to a large extent because this is still a very uh, research-heavy space. But one of the things I find fascinating about what Laura explained um, is that there's the, the whole gateway API and MCS API interaction revolves around an object, the service import, uh, which from the MCS perspective is an implementation detail. Because when you interact with uh, multi-cluster, as a user, all you say is that you create a service export. And at some point in the near future, that will result in you being able to access a service through DNS from your other clusters. You don't care about the service import. You don't care about the endpoint sizes and so on. And so in theory, we could have written the spec without that. But then Gateway API would have had a harder time. And it turns out that service import was a really useful object yeah. just in terms of being able to consume it. Yeah, absolutely. So one of the other things uh, that's been going on during this time is service meshes have largely been evolving uh, kind of on a parallel track outside of the cap or get process. So it's had given them a bit more freedom to innovate, but now we're kind of at a point where we're realizing that a lot of our meshes are doing fundamentally similar things, at least at the core. We all, of course, have specializations and different features. Um, but there's an interesting benefit here where we could have a common configuration language um, for at least like the base set of stuff. And looking at what was happening in Gateway, Gateway API, it started to make a lot of sense seeing we're doing traffic shifting and HTTP root in Gateway API is basically doing the same thing. So how can we start applying some of these concepts to this east-west use case? And I've been keeping an eye on what's been happening in SIG multi-cluster for a couple years now. Um, it's been really interesting to follow. I think one of the challenges is that it started a bit earlier than we saw a lot of end users having that multi-cluster use case and really that need as a pain point. So I guess just like as a show of hands here, like how many folks are using uh, MCS API currently? And how many folks are managing multiple clusters in production currently? A lot more. <laughs> so yeah, what we're hoping to do is make it easier for everyone to manage multiple clusters in production as part of integrating all three of these APIs together. Yeah, and how many people use service meshes? Yeah. All right. <laughs> Quite a bit more than use uh, MCS. <laughs> All right. We'll move on to the next question. Uh, how have they evolved separately and as part of a larger upstream initiative to make the multi-cluster ex experience feel more native? I think, Stephen, maybe do you want to start that? Um, yeah, I'm sorry. We did, <laughs> we did prepare this, but... <laughs> um, yeah, right. So this, yeah, so this ties back to some extent to what Mike was just saying about um, where the MCS API came from, really, because um, and as you might imagine, multi-cluster, and as we saw from the show of hands, lots of people have multiple clusters. A smaller subset uh, use service meshes, and a smaller subset still are aware of the MCS API and use that. And it, it's, it started out from... Um, one view of multi-cluster, I guess, which came from uh, Google, which is where you can have all these clusters that are considered to be the same from an administrative perspective and from how you want to use them, which isn't necessarily the case for in many other contexts, and that's where service meshes uh, come in. Um, and then there was work going on in the API without actual concrete implementations, which I think is a challenging um, situation to be in. 
Uh, and certainly when we started working on Submariner and integrating it into the MCS API, or at least trying to implement the MCS API with it, we were able to go back to the SIG and say, these things don't quite work as well as you thought, or maybe we're not quite understanding what you wanted to do with this, and that helps improve the, the SIG and make it more, uh, more real world. And I, I guess another big difference too is where uh, the outcome of the SIGs fit in to how you use Clusters Gateway API uh, has a direct representation on how you get your traffic to where you want it to go and how you make that available to users. Uh, service meshes also apply there um, with policy between services, uh, making services discoverable. Whereas the MCS API is a somewhat lower level API, I guess, more infrastructure oriented. Uh, so it's more a concern for infrastructure providers, perhaps, than actual end users. Yeah, so I can follow up on that a little bit. So MCS API offers two really valuable building blocks, is kind of like how we see it from the perspective of service mesh. So MCS API is, in isolation, can be used purely for a service discovery case uh, by creating service, in, service exports and using uh, the cluster set DNS to be able to uh, route traffic across clusters. Service export and service import are actually really useful objects. So we had a use case that didn't quite fit in console, but we definitely took inspiration uh, from the design of these. And hopefully, at some point, we can get upstream. We can converge with upstream in the future. Um, but exporting services um, allows you to do something um, across a cluster or administrative boundaries too. So uh, the was kind of like two different multi-cluster use cases that we've seen in the service mesh world. One is where you have multiple clusters or data centers that are logically identical and are basically serving the same services and you want them geo-redundant or highly available around the world and you just want um, to be able to like fail over to them as necessary or shift traffic between them as necessary, but they're all the same. In larger organizations, you often have that as a single team's boundary. But then, thanks to uh, some of the cloud vendors that have made Cube clusters very easy to create and manage, <laughs> uh, we've seen a challenge of cluster proliferation. So in some large organizations, instead of sharing one or a few Cube clusters, you end up with each team managing several of their own clusters. And then the organization as a whole needs to figure out, how do we do service networking across these different administrative boundaries of teams that are all managing their own clusters. So that's kind of where I'm hoping to see uh, MCS API evolve in the future, is to support both the like, sameness use case, but also like, across that cluster set boundary. So yeah, I think there's a, a lot of interesting work that could happen here. <laughs> yeah, great answer. Uh, you know, I, I just for for the sake of time, I think I'll I'll keep moving here. But just real briefly, I'll say that as as you've mentioned, uh, service import has been just a, a, a tremendous building block yeah. that we can build incredible things on top of with Gateway API. It just kind of slots in interchangeably with the service API. Uh, so in Gateway API, you can either use a service as a target or a service import, and they both generally work the same, except one is targeting a multi-cluster set of endpoints. So. Uh, really neat that the way multi-cluster services were designed, they just kind of fit in naturally without any extra thought. They just, it just feels like it works. Um, I'll move to the next one because it's a bit of a, a mouthful here, but uh, <laughs> you know, uh, we're gonna talk about CRDs. Uh, you know, these APIs are official Kubernetes APIs, but they're CRD based. And CRDs and this whole process is different and new to Kubernetes. So before I go much further here, how many of you have y installed a CRD in your cluster? OK. How many of you have had an issue installing a CRD or working with CRDs? Yeah, yeah. That, th they can be challenging. Uh, and th they definitely, I, I've had a talk before where I've complained about CRDs. So <laughs> I, I have my frustrations with CRDs. They, they are not a perfect thing by any means. Uh, you know, there, there are things that we miss. I've, I've worked on both upstream APIs, uh, so endpoint slice, ingress, uh, but I've also, of course, worked on gateway API, which is CRD-based. Um, despite our best efforts with upstream APIs, it's been very hard uh, 
to really collaborate on API design. The, the way enhancement process works, it's pretty rigid. There's a very clear timeline. Everything has to go through KEPS. There's, it, you know, we've tried, uh, and at best, we've had maybe five people able to collaborate on an API. Uh, Gateway API has 140 plus people that have contributed to it so far, and that number keeps on growing. So CRDs have enabled us to collaborate more than we've ever been able to before with, uh, with any Kubernetes API that I'm, I'm aware of. Uh, also, as you might expect, because these are CRDs, when we release a new version of Gateway API, it's immediately available, and we say we support the trailing five Kubernetes versions. So wherever you are, whatever cluster you have, you're probably within the latest five Kubernetes versions, hopefully. Uh, and in that case, you can go ahead and install the latest version of Gateway API, the latest controller, the latest implementation, and you're good to go. So again, one of the problems that we had with upstream APIs is there's this huge delay between, I'm going to try something and then wait a year, get some feedback. Oh, let me change that one thing. Wait another year, get some feedback. It, this is a much faster uh, feedback cycle, and that's been really helpful to us to iterate. And you know, also, we've got lots of implementations. Uh, we have around 20, more than 20 implementations now. And that's helped provide very helpful feedback and ensure that the API we're building uh, is really, uh, truly portable across lots of different vendors. Uh, maybe one of you want to chime in? I'm not sure. Yeah. So uh, one of the keys to this portability is conformance tests. So this is something that lets us know that all of these different implementations are actually behaving in a standard expected way. So this has really been enormously beneficial in enabling implementations. Um, and I'm also really excited that MCS is starting work to add conformance yeah. tests. So yeah, indeed. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So this is this is it's a, it's a really big deal and because it enables implementation. So um, as an example, um, when I started working on Console's API Gateway implementation of Gateway API, um, one of the things that was happening was our, the conformance tests for Gateway API were still being written at that time, largely. So while we had looking at the spec, we can read stuff and figure out, OK, this mostly makes sense. This is how these resources map to each other. Sometimes there were unclear behaviors. And in that case, one of the things that was really, really helpful was opening PRs upstream to add or propose new conformance tests. And then that drives a conversation upstream across multiple implementations on what is the actual expected behavior and what should it be. And do some implementations do different things today? And some of that stuff is like, OK, we can have a little bit of flexibility here, and we'll end up making some compromises so that everybody agrees that the behavior makes sense. Uh, so yeah, so this has been an enormous boon for driving consensus across implementations, as well as being a tool for understanding, am I building a thing that actually implements the spec the way it is designed? So yeah, um, that's been really helpful. And I am so excited that MCS is starting work on adding conformance tests to the project. I think it'll yep. be really beneficial for enabling additional, additional implementations. Definitely, yeah. And it's also interesting to. Uh, measure the spec itself, because as we implement conformance tests, we realize that there are some features that none of the implementations implement the way we thought the spec <laughs> meant they should. <laughs> and so sometimes that means that we need to go and revisit the spec, or perhaps go and educate all the implementers. But uh, <laughs> you know, it's one of the first implementations of, uh, as you might expect, of the MCS API, since it came from Google, was in GKE. And for a long time, the GKE implementation was actually quite far from being spec compliant. <laughs> so when you see that happen, obviously, it means that there are you know, it, things take a while to settle. <laughs> It's also a bit easier to almost like TDD a project <laughs> when, <laughs> instead of trying to read through the caps with the fine tooth comb and figure out what's this actually mean? Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. <laughs> the MCS spec is quite short. <laughs> yeah. We don't have hundreds of gaps to read. No, through. no. Th th <laughs> thankfully, I think it's like two. Or something like that. Yeah. All right, we'll move on to our last question. We'll keep this short so we have uh, time for your questions as well. Uh, but 
finally, where do these all fit in the ecosystem of service discovery solutions, service meshes, and vendor-specific tooling? Maybe, Mike, you can start us off. Whew. Um, <laughs> I guess I, I feel like I touched on this a little bit in the beginning, where we're starting to see this kind of convergence between these different APIs and finding them as a way to have a like common set of tools to solve problems that most users of any of these individual projects are facing. And I think one of the real boons here is that we've seen that for as much excitement as there is around Kubernetes, as many people as there are at this conference today, um, it's still on like the leading edge of the adoption curve. We know that there are a lot of folks that are not doing this yet. And one of the biggest challenges there is uh, education. It's the building that skill set to be able to work on these projects. And having this portable configuration language helps enable that. If instead of learning one of 20 different ingresses, you have to learn one gateway API, then if you move to a new job or if you have to train somebody new who's joining uh, your, play, your workplace, there's one thing that you can get started with that will get you a significant part of the way there of understanding how to do this work. So uh, yeah, it, and there's also ecosystem benefits to that too of um, we know that there's folks that are developing learning courses and things like that. So yeah, hopefully this work, kind of the convergence, helps benefit growing the community as a whole. It's one of the things I'm most excited about. Yeah, yeah I don't have much to add, really. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Uh, yeah, I'll just say real briefly, uh, you know, obviously, I, I, coming from the GK perspective, uh, we've loved the features that this unlocks for us. Uh, earlier this KubeCon, I think on Wednesday, I. Uh, had a talk uh, with uh, Lee Wen from AWS, and we talked about how cloud providers, uh, them on EKS and us on GKE, are using these two AP APIs together to enable some really powerful routing across clusters. Because, of course, Gateway API enables lots of advanced routing functionality that hasn't been in Kubernetes yet. And then multi cluster services allows us to bridge that multi cluster service gap. So, combined, they're a really cool uh, set of APIs to work with. Uh, but with that, I, I want to make sure we have time for questions. So uh, if anyone has questions, if you can line up at either of these mics, and we'll be happy to continue the discussion there. Uh, thanks, everyone. Hello. So I had a talk with a few friends yesterday about uh, all of these new CRDs that are coming in. How do you manage dependencies across CRDs? Because that's been an issue with a lot of other uh, systems in the past. So I can see that it might be an issue with versioning. How do the controllers fit together and such? Yeah, that, that's been a, a huge challenge. Uh, in Gateway API, we've been really focused on backwards compatibility. Uh, so similar to what you'd expect in upstream, we want to ensure that you can upgrade to the latest version of, C of a CRD. And even if the controller or controllers you have in your cluster are expecting an older version of a CRD, that'll still work. And similarly, if your controllers are expecting a newer version of the CRD, that should also still work. Uh, so we're really, really focused on ensuring that Whatever version of the API you have installed, it should be compatible. Of course, we're encouraging everyone to keep on the latest version. Uh, of course, on, you know, on GK, for example, we'll just manage that for you and install the latest CRDs across all versions. Uh, that's what we recommend most people do. Uh, because again, this is backwards compatible. You're not going to lose anything by upgrading to the latest set of CRDs. Um, they're just purely additive changes. Uh, great question. Uh, I don't yeah. know if anyone. Yeah, well, MCS avoids that by only having a single version so far. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Yeah, right. um, related to, to uh, his question, um, I, have you given any feedback to API machinery, uh, come up with ideas for um, how we should be advancing CRDs themselves? Um, because this is another example of, of using CRDs, which are a very generic concept, for something very specific. Um, and I'm thinking that through both of these APIs, we might be looking at, okay, for Kubernetes, what comes after CRDs? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we have 
a wish list uh, <laughs> that we've shared with API Machinery. Uh, there's a doc and I think an issue tracking that. Uh, and yeah, you know, I, I want to say that uh, although CRDs have their issues, they've enabled so much here that I, you know, I, as much as I can complain about them, the, the things that they have done for us are amazing. So, uh, and they are only getting better. Uh, you know, the, there have been some talks at KubeCon uh, that have mentioned the, the updates to CEL uh, that enable a lot of really advanced functionality right into CRDs. Uh, so it will take some time, and especially because we're supporting the trailing five releases of Kubernetes, it will take longer for us. But there is a lot of good work going on, and we are trying to collaborate with API Machinery to ensure that CRDs only get better over time. Yeah. The, the CEL stuff in particular, uh, for folks who haven't uh, heard about it, it allows like, synchronous validation of CRDs. So right now, Gateway API is dependent on installing an admission webhook, and that's the thing that you have to assume a user does, and then if it's not there or doesn't catch it, you have to, if you're building a Gateway API controller, figure out what to do in the event that something sneaks by it. So yeah, CL, we can't use it today because of the version policy, but it was really exciting to kind of like see how we'll be able to make CRDs more robust in the near future. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and so that makes me sort of think of, you know, well, the usual, uh, appeal that you'll get from uh, and talks about there about SIGs, which is that really, if you have frustrations with CRDs, do uh, voice them, uh, <laughs> join the SIG calls. It might, from the outside, it might seem like this big intimidating uh, set of cabals that run Kubernetes, but in practice, it's just a few people, and <laughs> we would like more, <laughs> more people. And for example, in, in SIG MCS, what we see is that there are maybe four or five people who are uh, involved over the long term, and we see people pop up every now and again. Uh, someone will come along and give us a demo of an implementation, and then we'll never hear about that implementation ever again. And then we'll hear from other people that there's this implementation that we've never heard about that's actually quite good or is gaining traction, or this cloud provider has made available, uh, has added the MCS API to their offering without telling us about it. So there's this big disconnect between what the six perceive and what happens in the real world. Um, so yeah, more input from end users. And it doesn't have to be getting involved, just coming along and saying, yeah. hi, we're using your stuff. And one of the benefits of whether you're an end user or an implementer of either of these specs is participating in the discussion in this meeting is a way to help influence the shape of it. Both of these are still rapidly evolving. So if there's something that your implementation needs to do or wants to advance upstream or wants to uh, figure out how to make the spec support uh, a specific use case that your users care about, um, Now's the time to do that. <laughs> like, come join the SIGs, uh, join the discussions. Um, Gateway API meets Monday evenings in a US time. Uh, uh, Gamma meets Tuesdays um, bi weekly, or yeah, swapping between an EU friendly time and a US friendly time uh, on alternating weeks. And, and SIG multi cluster. Yeah, yeah, SIG multi cluster is Tuesday at a European friendly time. So, yes. you, um, Mornings for the West Coast and uh, late afternoon for Europe. Yeah, and, bi weekly. And yeah, don't be afraid to just pop into a call or if you see something that doesn't make sense, open an issue. Like that was how I first got engaged with Gateway API was lurking on the calls with my camera off, kind of just paying attention and seeing what's happening. And then when we started implementing it, filing issues for things that I saw in the spec that didn't make sense. So there, it's definitely an accessible project, both of them, all, all three of them if you count Gamma, uh, yeah, <laughs> that where we want uh, new users to join and help determine where these are going. Yep, and to avoid having it all end in tragedy. <laughs> <laughs> all right, I think we've hit time. Thank you so much, everyone.